Welcome everybody for joining us once again for Alberta Craft Council Monday Meetup, uh, a series of lightly moderated uh, webinars that we do upon occasion. And that today we are honored and delighted to have uh, Dr. Anne Zanette from the University of Alberta joining us today for the science behind the mask. And I'm just gonna start with introduction um, of myself. We have just a few things to say, uh, to speak to. My name is Saskia Arts and I am the uh, fund developer and special projects and the occasional exhibition curator at the Alberta Craft Council. Like many places we are, we have many roles to fill, but it's a fantastic organization. And I will be your point person uh, for any questions. And so if you have any questions whatsoever, please put them in the chat box and we'll, you'll see that below on your screen. And I will make note of everything and we'll stop, I will unput, uh, stop Dr. Ibisanet every once in a while with some pointed questions and then we will carry on. So there'll be a, there will be time to ask questions. We will also be uh, recording this presentation today uh, for the benefit of those who were unable to attend and that will live on YouTube uh, later. And we will also be sending out some links as well that Dr. Ibisanet has been very gracious to share with us. Uh, so if you wanna share that with your friends, I think this mask making is going to be a, a apropos topic for a little while. And you may also choose to, if some of you already have, choose to turn off your video at any time. Uh, we do ask that you ensure that you are muted at all times, please, just so that we don't have any feedback loops. And also joining us today is Victoria Sanchez. She is our marketing guru at the Alberta Craft Council. She's waving right now. And so she will also ensure that you stay muted and should you be unruly, you will be turfed to the waiting room. So just, she will do that. And, um, and so she'll keep everything running smoothly from a technical standpoint. And we also have some other staff as well. I see Jenna Stanton, our lovely executive director uh, joining us as well today. I think just as a participant, she's taking, taking a back seat today. So that's, that's lovely for her. And then I also want to make a do a, a brief a land acknowledgement as well. And I apologize, I have a screen to the side. So I'm not being skittish. I just have a secondary monitor. So apologies for that. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Alberta is the home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. Those of us joining from Alberta are on the traditional lands referred to Treaty 6, 7 and 8 territories. All of us are beneficiaries of these peace and friendship treaties. And the Alberta Craft Council is dedicated to ensuring that the spirit of these treaties are honored and respected. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you a researcher and associate professor in material culture at the University of Alberta, Dr. Anne Bizonet. Dr. Bizonet, she teaches material culture and cur curatorship and is the curator of the university's Anne Lambert clothing and textiles collection. Her areas of research consist of fashion from the eight, late 18th century to the present day with a special interest for the cut and construction of clothing, how bodies and clothes interact and how the convergence, and sorry, and on the convergence between art, fashion and science. And in today's webinar, Dr. Bizonet will share her research about the science behind the homemade cloth mask. And as she says, what appears to be a simple object is actually quite problematic. As a garment made by individuals who are using materials readily found in their surroundings and in designs that like the materials have not been tested for the sorry, effectiveness in preventing infection, the face mask varies immensely from maker to maker. So that her, she's done an incredible amount of research and design uh, on this. So we would love to turn it over to Dr. Bissonnette. Thank you, Saskia. And thank you everyone for joining. I'm so happy to be here. Um, in some ways, I'd rather not be here because we'd rather not talk about face masks, but we are here. This is the, the hand that has been dealt to us. And as makers and as people who think about um, garment in a critical way, um, I was one of those individuals who um, had a distant interest in the topic. I um, has, has been said the curator of the clothing and textile collection. I have a background as a fashion designer. And obviously I still make things because I love to make things. And when this whole issue of face masks came along, um, I was looking at the news like most of you, and I was trying to make sense of it. 
Now, I am not a textile scientist, and there are textile scientists on staff at the University of Alberta. Um, but what I do is um, looking at garments, especially in um, this convergence between practice and this critical approach to the research that has been done. Um, I was trying to make sense of the information brought to us. So what um, happened, um, most good research is personal. Um, and so mine happened when um, I realized that uh, Montreal, where I'm from, and a lot of my families from Quebec in general, um, was at the, the epicenter of um, this novel coronavirus um, infection in Canada. And by May 10th of this year, the La Presse newspaper um, said that it was the seventh deadliest, deadliest place in the world to live. And um, there's all sorts of reasons behind this, but at the end, I was concerned. I was concerned about family members. I was concerned about my people. And at the same time, a lot of the coverage on the issue of face mask was basically saying that, oh, face masks give people a false sense of security. So I went with that for a while until about early April when the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, um, revised their um, mandate for the general population. They had been going around with this idea of false sense of security and they realized that this was probably not um, the way to go. And in hindsight, and always in hindsight, it's easy to assess all of this. Um, I started thinking, and even this morning, I was thinking, that made no sense. They gave people no benefit of the doubt that they could judge information for themselves. Do we say to people, well, if we tell them to wear a life jacket on, on watercraft, it will give them this false sense of security that they can go fast. No, in fact, it makes us in some ways very much aware that there are security risks. Um, likewise, for safety belts in cars, do we drive faster because we have them? No, but this is hindsight. What really happened and what I think is really important for us to remember is that the, the information that keeps on trickling um, all the time, it just never ends, but um, one of the most important things that happened to change the CDC's guidelines was that they found that any one of us can be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So obviously um, that means that I can have the virus, um, but I have no symptoms. I'm ignorant that I'm contagious. Or I have just been infected. I went to the um, March Against Racism and I looked around and I was wearing my thing, but things can happen, right? And it might take two, three days for me to actually develop symptoms. So I may not be aware just yet that I am infected. So in an article from May 29th, the New York Times reported that some studies show that people who have no symptoms seem to have uh, viral loads, that is the amount of virus in our bodies, just as high as those who are seriously ill. So this is really important. Um, additionally, they found that some coronavirus patients are most infectious, in, I can't say that word properly, infectious, uh, anyway, have um, the ability to infect others um, two or three days before the symptoms begin, and they may be just as infectious as those who are sick in the midst of it. So obviously, um, this was um, something that changed the CDC, and it was my aha moment, and it might have been yours too. So then from this moment on, if I don't feel sick, it doesn't matter that I'm not um, sick or feeling sick. Um, if I don't feel sick, I wear a mask when I go out. Um, I may be just as dangerous as other battling the disease or more. And in order to stop the transmission, it is all of us, it is our responsibility to share this burden. So do we all follow this, I will wear a mask when I'm outside, even though it's not the most pleasant thing? No. Um, governments have been very lax into um, mandating this in our country and in the US, for example. And I will go into the government information a little bit later. There's some strength, there's some limitation to the message that they're sending. But 
from my research, I will share with you what I call um, the 10 pronouncements. I didn't call them commandments because I'm not here to commend. Maybe the government um, is not willing to do that either. But we'll start by looking at the research. And the research goes back. There is some research and there's some good and there's some faulty research. But research is never perfect. There's a lot of interdisciplinary um, individuals that have come to the, and more and more even nowadays, because we feel that it's so important. Um, a lot of engineers, for example, letting go of their research on other subjects and saying, maybe I can help on this topic. So um, obviously the idea that we can be asymptomatic was important. And one of the in really interesting information that I found, because I'm a dress historian, so history is of interest to me, um, is this idea that the research goes back all the way, um, even as early as 1910. So in 1910, that's a long time ago, a young Chinese doctor called Wu Lang Te uh, was sent to this region in China where there was an unknown plague that was killing most of the people who um, were contact, contracted this disease. It turned out to be mnemonic plague. And this young doctor figured out that it was spread by air and he developed a mask made out of packed cotton fiber. So if you imagine um, 1.3 centimeters thick of these loose uh, fibers put together, so packed cotton fiber, what we would consider you know, non-woven fibers put together, encased them in very loose cotton gauze. So the exterior of this mask was not that important, but um, it was something that had um, really good results. This young French, actually, I'm not sure he was young, this French doctor arrived on the scene and treated him with racial contempt. And frankly, I think there's still some racial um, contempt that is happening right now. We see footage of people in um, different continents, in Asia, um, in China, everybody's wearing a face mask, but for some reason, we don't think they have science or that it applies to us. So I'm just going to try in the um, current scenario when we are talking about race, to put that in, in our minds to think about this. This French doctor uh, did not wear the mask went out, uh, was dead within a few days, and the Chinese doctor continued to practice until he was 80 years of age and fought this plague on several fronts and it paid off and they mastered this plague. Now, there's been other plagues, as we call them, other pandemics, and in 1918, um, in 1938, there's all sorts of studies that came out, and these studies are especially interesting to me because prior to the development of synthetic fabrics, a lot of the things that people have at home are similar to what may be um, found at this point in our home. And what we find is that a lot of engineers are testing fabrics. Some of them are testing fabrics and masks, both of them combined, but a lot of them mostly fabrics. And um, there have been very good studies made on what we call N95 masks. We should call them, while they are a mask, they are really a respirator. So a respirator is different than just a face mask. The respirator is there to stop um, us breathing anything, um, any kind of particles coming from others to us. This is not what the homemade face mask is built to do. Um, surgical masks, like homemade face masks, can stop our germs or our particles with viral um, particles coming out of our masks to others. Now, the N95 respirators, just like the surgical mask, you've seen some of these surgical masks, polypropylene, um, elastics on the side, pleats in the front, they are very standardized. There are standards for them. Manufacturers have to obey by these standards. Um, they are tested because it's all um, very much um, controlled. So what do we have with homemade face masks that are quite different? And I forgot to mention, but I'm fairly sure most of you have seen an N95 respirator. Also polypropylene, but um, this uh, thickness of this fiber um, it can be different. Um, also, there's a lot of what we call electrostatic charges put on them, which um, in time when you wear it a lot, um, sort of um, loses its effectiveness. But we're not talking about this. This is not what my research was focusing on. What I was trying to look um, 
four in the research was homemade face masks. And one of the things that is obvious that most people don't discuss, and they should, I don't know why they're not discussing it, is the fact that they are not following any standards. Why? Because homemade masks are made of very different supplies available to an ordinary person at home. And this varies greatly. What I have in my home is different than what you have in your home. And even us as individuals who sew, who are interested in fiber, who are makers, um, may have a stash of fabric that is very different. So this lack of standardization is a big problem. It makes it very hard to verify, to replicate test results. And these are actions at the core of scientific methods. So individuals that may uh, be textile scientists and be interested in this problem will be at a loss to say, okay, take this fabric that's in your home and with that fabric, with that design, you can have, and they give you a certain degree of, um, of how efficient this in stopping particles from exiting the mask. So it's a problem because scientists like to be precise, follow methods. So here I am as a dress historian, not a textile scientist, giving you um, an informed opinion based on the research of individuals who very often are not well, um, I don't know if they're, uh, there's a lack of interest or a lack of knowledge that there is a world of textiles where there is more than just saying, I use a cotton fabric. Cotton is a fiber, it's not a fabric. There's a weave structure, there's a density, a thread count. There are different chemical structures, um, mercerization, for example, of cotton. How does this impact what we're going to experience using different types of fabrics? So um, what we have are researchers who are well-intentioned, and we have the main problem meaning that there is no knowledge or interest in the world of textiles. And for example, in 2008, there was a very good um, paper that was produced from um, one of these institutions in the Netherlands. Um, I can find the information I hear. I wrote it for um, National Institute of Public Health and the Environment in the Netherlands. And they tested things like scarves and um, they mentioned how they use a tea towel. Well, maybe in the Netherlands, all the tea towels are the same. Um, and they gave the name of one manufacturer, but tea towels are all different. Was it fabric? Uh, was it made out of linen fiber? Was it made out of cotton fiber? They did not say. What was the weave structure? So all these things that I brought up um, is something that's very hard for me to say to you, do use a tea towel none of us will have the same type of thing. Any kind of fabric wrapped around one's neck can be a scarf. So saying that people are testing scarves is obviously a major issue. Now, that being said, um, they still tested different fabrics. And we have, all the way to 1910, our friend Wu Lian Tai um, was testing what we call a non-woven fabric. So it's not just woven fabric, but also non-woven. And he used woven gauze, loosely put together, with this packed cotton fiber in between, so a non-woven in between a woven. So we're talking about layers of different types of textile, woven and non-woven, as far back as 1910. And we have, um, I don't think most of us have a lot of uh, cotton fibers hanging loose in our house. Maybe we can open a comforter and find, but even then, but we do have certain products like a non-woven um, cotton absorbent paper towel, what we call Scott towel. We may also have um, coffee filters. These are non-woven um, and we have very thin and we can have different layers of this put together. So obviously um, the government of Canada knows about non-woven fibers. Uh, of, of fabrics. And they have in one of their website described a um, non-sewed mask and they've inserted a coffee filter cut together. And that's the only difference between that and all of the CDC's masks. So essentially the Canadian government copied word for word, nearly word for word, except for a few things such as that coffee filter that they added in. So in my opinion, um, 
it's good that they pointed this out, but it's also something that could be addressed in that this is a somewhat standardized product. If I say to you, go get a coffee filter or a paper towel, you'll know what this is. You may have access to it. So while everything was shut down except for grocery stores, and I had to figure out, well, what kind of non-woven is accessible, this was a very good example. So um, when engineers talk about textiles, there's a lack of knowledge. But in the past, when there were textile industries in this country and in this continent um, overall, and people were much more aware of uh, weave structures and the properties of fibers, we talked all the way back to 1918 about things like thread count, um, warp and weft and measuring them. We talked about weave density, which varied in medical gauze that people could buy at um, a drugstore, for example, compared one company to the other. So this lack of standardization, but again, this variability, people tested that. We talked about breathability and comfort. Um, some studies from 1919 all the way to today will say the more layers of fabric, the better. But all the way to 1918, this was pointed as a flaw. Because if there's too many layers of fabric in front of you and you add a non-woven and several layers of coffee filters, for example, um, if it's so difficult for you to breathe through these fabrics, the air will take the past path of least resistance and will find alternative ways through the cracks, well, not cracks, but through the openings of your mask. And the air will then not be filtered through this mask. So you may put a lot of effort and at the end, it's too hard to breathe. So breathability is super important. Yes, you can create a mask. Yes, it, it could be of all different fibers. But for example, um, this idea of making a mask with a pocket and putting this non-woven inside and testing this, even before you make the mask, test to see, can I breathe easily through this? And this is an issue because I made all these masks, send them to family in Montreal, and my mom said, well, yeah, except I can't breathe really well into this mask. And obviously that's not gonna help. So developing alternatives that have very densely woven on one side, the exterior side, and more loosely woven, um, the one that is closer to your, um, to your mouth, and inserting that same type of paper inside and testing that for people who have trouble breathing is a good idea. So every mask in some ways helps. They're not all built equal. I wish my mom could breathe in this really densely woven two-sided one, but you know what? I'd rather she wear a mask that is um, slightly less um, uh, densely woven, but she still wears it rather than not at all. So we have to take into account um, also people that have um, different issues. I wear glasses. I wear glasses all the time, different kind of glasses. The um, most masks that are created are not accommodating of my glasses. So what I ended up doing is a mask that can be worn two ways. Either you have a fold on top, which is different than the Canadian government and the CDC, which all have a seam. So if you have a seam on top, you have four layers of fabric to put between your glasses and uh, your nose. And it tends to bring your glasses up. And if you're like me and you have bifocals, it screws up your vision. So um, we have either the two layers because the mask is placed on a fold, or you can wear it the other way where you put the seam. And if you can, in the seam, I think I have one here. Where did I put my seam? Just one second. So in the seam um, is a little opening. And I don't know if you can see that, but I think the, the blue one shows it better. So in the seam, you have a little opening. And in this opening here, you insert um, a paper clip that you turn into a nose um, clip. So by inserting this clip, you um, can try to see if the mask will still work with your glasses. If it works, that's the best way. You want a really good fit. If it doesn't work, then you wear the mask on the other side with a fold on top, and that can work better for people um, who have glasses that are very close to their nose. So I'm diverging a little bit, but when I'm, I'm keeping my, my um, eye on the clock here, 
what I'm trying to get to is that we have these masks and we can make them out of different fabrics. The non-woven is super important, but also the ability to explain to people why you need masks. Because most people in this country and in North America um, look at people who wear masks in somewhat of a suspicious way. And as I said, you know, there might be a bit of racism there um, as well. But if people have beautiful masks and they never wear them, then we're not really going to get out of this um, issue. So cultural issues exist, trying to justify, rationalize, look at the information with a critical mind and say, okay, um, is this the best that we can do? Is this as good as N95? No, but because it's not as good as an N95, doesn't mean that we should just throw the baby with the bathwater. So um, understanding the limits of this, masks by themselves are not alone. They have to be used in conjunction with all of the measures that we know and maybe not love, but we know washing our hands, social distancing, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So are they made to be worn for many hours? Um, there are research that actually points to the fact that N95s are difficult to wear. Um, certain people who have respiratory issues find them uncomfortable. Um, in certain hospitals, they don't necessarily give people N95s who are having trouble breathing. These um, are not as effective. They're not 95, far from. Um, the numbers vary depending on different individuals uh, and different research. Very often, they will test the fabric, but they won't test the design. And frankly, um, the design is also important because if there's not a good seal between the mask and your face, all the air will exit and this filtration will not really um, carry through. So I'm sure there are better designs than this mask. Um, having the ability to have a pocket inside, writing what is the inside and what is the outside is important because you don't want to start handling um, this mask and putting the um, backside in or vice versa. So um, I will go back to the research and I ask Saskia to interrupt me if there are major questions at this point, but you're here to, to talk about the research and we'll do a little bit of um, I, a review in some ways of this issue of false security. And some people still say wearing a mask is a false sense of security. And in many ways, the CDC, when they were thinking that masks gave a false sense of security, were looking at research that had been done in 2006 and how the outcome of the, the research was talking about, um, we're not quite sure, the research is not quite there, but the tighter the weave structure, the better the potential for filtration. Think about the virus being so, so small, smaller than a bacteria. A virus is very small. Um, and think about it in terms of a hockey puck, because we're Canada, um, and a net in the back. The net has to be smaller than the puck in order to um, hold it. Well, no fabric, no woven fabric is small enough but the smaller the net and the more likely, and there's all sorts of other physical um, effects at work too. Um, there are some um, superior filtration that occur with the non-woven because a non-woven is made out just like um, Wu Ting Ye, I can't remember his name, I have to look it up. Uh, Wu Ying Tai's uh, pack of cotton fibers there's this very difficult path for the virus to get through. There's all of these things that are put together. So the virus will not start to go around fibers in the same way. So adding this is actually um, quite important to any type of um, fabric that you use. So keep that in mind. Um, it's something that I think most of you can insert in. You do something that's quite lovely outside but you make sure that you have the pocket in order to um, suggest, strongly suggest the non-woven fiber, uh, the non-woven textile. So um, what we have after 2006 are different research that actually like the one I mentioned in, um, from the Netherlands that tested tea cloth. Now, not knowing what these tea cloths were, um, 
came to the conclusion that any type of general mask use is likely to decrease viral exposure and infection risk on a population level. So the CDC knew, and there were other things in 2010, um, about the, the lesser performance of cloth homemade face mask, but they had the ability to lessen um, infection. But they chose to tell us, mm, maybe not to wear it. This could be a false sense of security. So overall, what we know is that there's more research that needs to be done, not only on um, textiles where the fiber is known, the fiber um, uh, treatment like mercerization, the weave structure, the thread count. So look for that. Um, sheets, pillowcases, cheaper than sheets. Very high quality sheets will often state what kind of weave structures they have. So most of my masks came from very high quality sheets that I sacrificed for the cause. And obviously um, the thread count is listed on the package when they're especially of high quality. And that is um, regulated by governments. So if they tell you 280 threads per inch, or sometimes they do centimeters, um, but most of the time inches, that is something that you say, okay, it is controlled. So investing in high um, thread count pillowcases to do um, at least one of the surfaces is important because if not, you can buy a pick glass and count, but it's not that easy, especially in high uh, thread count fabrics. So overall, keep in mind that these face masks are not the same as respirators. Um, that you have to use other measures, um, that any mask is better than no mask, and that breathability is crucial. If you can't breathe, the air takes the path of least resistance. More layer better? No. So this is out there, but this has been proven um, to be false. So what we want to do is encourage the insertion of a non-woven textiles, um, these masks that have a seam in the front, if you think about it, first, it's hard to put um, a pocket with the seam front. They fit the face better, but they also create openings in between um, the stitches for the air right in front of your mouth to just go straight out. So this virus is very, very small. Most of the um, individuals that tested masks tested cotton masks. Why? It is really not explained. There's different possibilities. These are informed um, opinions on my part. A, likely because most people have cotton, cotton sheets, for example, um, at home. So saying to people, use cotton textiles is feasible. 100% cotton has been um, pretty standard, but a lot of us have cotton polyester and there is really no research on this combination. Um, of fibers that I can trust right now. There's some peer-reviewed information that came out in late April. It had been reviewed in three days, which is very atypical. Usually it's like six to nine months. And there's big red flags that most of you, when you read the scientific literature, again, saying we tested scarves. Um, they don't test the fit. So fit is an issue, the tighter fit the possible. So cotton may be suggested because it is absorbent. When you put that uh, paper towel, it also helps to absorb spit or cough or things like this, because the more the mask is wet, uh, that is providing an, uh, an environment for viruses to um, be very happy in. So the hot breath, the wet environment, that's not very good. The moment you come home or you're at a place where you can remove it safely, wash it, um, wash it in hot water and you put it in the dryer, and you wash your hands, you always treat it as if it's contaminated. I think people have told us this in the past. Um, you try to um, envision this mask as something that is um, an item of garment that has huge amount of limitation, but that still has some efficacy in fighting the virus. Now, Surface treatments can vary. Embroidery, for example, may create little holes around it. Well, if you add that um, paper face, paper uh, non-woven, that could help mitigate this. Um, when we talk about dyeing, dyeing is perfectly fine. It doesn't create little holes, again, that impact uh, the structure of the fabric. 
you want to be part of the solution, you want to create something nice, but you don't want to endanger somebody by creating so many openings in this math masks that will lessen its efficacy. So if we look at the mask that I created, that's already falling apart on the wall over here, I can tell over here, um, we have two different situations. You can have this rectangle that's uh, 36 by 24. All this information is on our website. Um, or, like my mom, who has breath trouble breathing with, uh, with this type of fabric, you can have a very loose fabric on top, slightly offset, so it doesn't arrive just at the fold. And this ability to have um, the fold to go under your glasses is important for 2.2 billion people in the world who wear glasses. And you have four strings that you can sew or you can buy um, this kind of commercial uh, ribbon or bias uh, tape. Obviously during the pandemic, um, the fabric stores were closed, so this was much more readily um, easy to do. You can do something that folds the fabric the first time, top and bottom, and then folds it again. Now this is different than the government of Canada's mask. And if you look at this mask over here, they do not fold it twice. And that leads to a lot of unraveling. So as you unravel, you breathe them in, it gets to be bothersome. You wanna to touch your face, which you really, the, the mask, it's one thing that helps you is that it helps you not touch your face. So fold it twice rather than once, as the government says. And um, what we also have here, you can see how these four layers go under your nose, which adds bulk, which is not the best thing. And um, there's no place to put a non-woven material. So that's not the best um, solution. Um, this solution enables you to have the pocket construction and enables you to wear your mask two ways with a fold up or with the hem and the little clip, uh, paper clip inside. Remember to leave an opening um, on one end to insert the paper clip. The paper clip is just a three centimeter paper clip like this one here. And I changed it to look, I'm trying to figure out where the best place is, to look like a little mountain. So the little mountain goes over the nose very well. And this enables you to remove it, put it in the wash, put it back afterward. Everybody's got paper clips at home or so I think, or so I hope. Um, if not this, they may have all other types of garden wires. You create folds above and underneath. The first mask I did actually created these folds once this was folded in half, but I found that it was hard to insert the um, paper uh, towels inside. So now I put the fold on top on both sides. I sew it on the side and then I add these little strings, fold it in half so that the string is in the pocket and sew the edges of the mask together. So like this, their little edges are hidden. I turn it over and so the edges stick out and then I top stitch it. So you can see that the pocket is there. This is version one that my mom can't breathe through, but it's easier to show you um, this version. At some point when you attach these two fabrics together, so you either do version one on top or version two for the people who have trouble breathing, and you obtain a mask that is either the same on both sides or that has um, the fabric in the back and uh, loosely, tight, tightly woven outside, loosely woven inside, and voila. Now, Dr. Dr. Bissonnette, may I yes. interject for a moment? We sure. have some questions. Oh, good. <laughs> so before we move on to construction, um, we had some questions about that that non-woven layer in the center. So paper towels and uh, coffee filters, are there other yes. commonly found materials that could also be used? Yes, um, some of you might have polypropylene bags. So these tote bags made out of non-wovens that you use like a few times and after a while they start to tear. Um, so that's the same fabric as an N95. That being said, they're not really the same because the thickness of it differs. And the N95, as I mentioned before, has electrostatic charges applied to it, which makes it 95% um, with the fit um, efficient. So a lot of people have said that if you use the same fa fabric, polypropylene, for example, then this is as effective or something made out of a tote bag made out of poly polypropylene would be as effective. It's not. 
Um, as I said, there's no standardization and there's different treatment and thicknesses of the polypropylene. But this is one that you can put in. Say, for example, I don't know if you've worn these. These are government of Alberta or I don't know. Um, let's see here. Things that were handed out at McDonald's and A&W's in Alberta recently. And it comes as a pack and you wear it. And it's not the most comfortable, in my opinion, because it's the feel of this polypropylene on your um, mouth is is the comfort is not that great. But if you put this kind of polypropylene in cotton and the cotton is more absorbent and you're likely to wear this mask longer, then that could be very good. Also, because I'm on the subject of um, these face masks, these um, ear attached masks are easy to get on and off, but it also leads you to pull this mask back and forth. And as I said before, the more you touch this mask and the more likely you are to say what the government said, oh, you're going to touch your face, you're going to infect yourself, cross-contamination. So in some ways, those long strands and those long ties in back stay secure. You're not touching your face as much. You wait until you're home to remove them. And if you're wearing glasses or hearing aids, um, they're not likely to be as much in the way compared to the elastics. So the elastics don't last very long. Um, these are not reusable. This is reusable. Um, if you put elastic on one like this because it's more comfortable, go ahead. But washing it in really high temperature affects the elastics in the long term. And you may not have elastics at home if this is in the middle of a pandemic. Other questions? Yes, that's good to know actually about the hot, the, uh, the hot water and the elastic. Yeah. Another question that came in was, would sport fabric or Gore-Tex be uh, work for one of the layers? Yeah, okay. So there's a lot of really interesting manufacturers that have shifted their company to, instead of creating sports garment, to create things for masks. And I actually had a question from a person in Edmonton, and there was a DuPont fabric that was coated with silver. There's all sorts of coating that they use. They all claim to make it, you know, wonderful antibacterial. If you remember a lot of the garments that people were buying so that their sweat would not um, impact, you know, their comfort and that of others. Um, so what we have with the coronavirus is not a bacterial um, situation. It's a viral situation. Uh, bacteria are much bigger. And um, as I said, like the research that I covered mostly talked about 100% cotton. So if some people had tested polyester, um, a lot of the research on that end was not conclusive. So I cannot tell you that uh, the claims of manufacturers are actually uh, true. A lot of claims are made and um, it's not for me to pass judgment on them. I'm, I'm not quite sure that they're always um, accurate. Any mask is better than no mask. So if all you have are sports attire, think about how um, polyester, for example, microfibers, the type of polyester, I believe, and it the, the water will stay on the surface of this textile and you may breathe it longer and um, not absorbing. If you want to put um, the paper towel inside something that's made out of polyester, test it and see how you breathe in it. But know that the research had not really um, done a lot with those types of fibers thus far. Thank you. Um, also, okay, sorry, you, you all missed my dog getting rather loud. Um, how often should we replace the non-woven filter? Um, every time you will use it. Because okay. obviously you have to um, think that this is filled with possibly um, dangerous uh, virus particles. So washing a paper towel doesn't work very well. Um, it destroys with time. So you really should, it's, it's I mean, it's not that expensive. And if that's a difference between something that's usable and not usable, um, I don't tell people to reuse this and I will not tell people to reuse this. That, however, um, has had studies. So it, we know that they can be sanitized in um, the wash and it could be put in a dryer and that it will kill the viruses. 
there are some studies that talk about putting um, such things in the microwave, but there's a problem with the microwave is that it's very spotty. Those of you who microwave a lot know that the center of your food might be a different temperature than the exterior. And so microwaving this might lead to spots that are um, nuked better than others. So it's best to wash them in hot water, sanitize, put in the dryer. Perfect. And uh, just lastly for now anyway, is I'm assuming that you'll break down the steps a little bit slower. So someone was already worried that they'd missed how to put the strings yeah. in and things like that. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, I can do that, but it's also explained on our website. I didn't want to bring a sewing machine here, so I made these samples. Okay. And I could certainly, once the questions are done, go over the steps one by one, so that those who are not wanting to do it now um, will go to the website. And those who are here and they want to know now, I'll go through this um, individually. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Bisonette. I will send it back to you. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have a few more minutes and I'm going to talk about some of the Government of Canada's um, web um, masks and how there are some issues if you're going to try to do something of that nature. So I've talked already about this mask that is basically the sewn mask from the Government of Canada. And it has two pieces, not too dissimilar to the end result of the mask we're creating. And there's two different fabrics. So one of the advantages is you know which one is close to your mouth and which one is outside. But you can also use an ink pen and write on your mask inside and outside so that you don't confuse the two. Um, as I said before, when you have to assemble these together, one of the problems is that you have four layers of textile as you fold it in, and you should really fold it another time so that it won't unravel. And so that's even more fabric that creates bulk in between your nose. So why not just use one long rectangle, and that rectangle can be folded in half, and the fold only has two layers, and it's easier to wear. It also creates a nice little pocket. Now you could create a pocket out of this too by not uh, finishing or assembling the two layers on the bottom. So um, that in some ways has a few difficulties. I think between Canada and the US they at first um, tell you to fold at 12 millimeters and then at six obviously they show you something and they actually do something else in the visual. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt in Canada that it should be six millimeter on both sides and you should really um, fold it again but then this becomes a very small area uh, to put over your, your mouth. So that's an issue. With the non-woven, I mean, oops, let me go here. I'm sorry, getting my props. So the government of Canada has also told people to use um, a bandana. So this is a bandana. They give the measurements. This is about the same measurements. And they tell you to fold it in half. So we already have two layers and then fold it in third which leads to six layers, and then to again fold it again, one on top of the other, which leads to, I think it's about 18 layers of fabric. So we talked about how um, breathability is an issue, and on top of that, they add the coffee filter in there too. So if your uh, bandana is made out of really thick fabric, breathing through 18 layers of fabric, plus a coffee filter, if you like to do this, is problematic. Um, but if that's what you have, is that the best situation? A lot of researchers have also talked about um, using batiks. So those of you in the fiber arts know that this type of surface decoration is not a textile. A batik is not a, it's a surface decoration on a textile. Many of the batiks are on cotton, obviously, but the density, um, the weave structure, these are all very different. So we find researchers, again, using names that uh, are not accurate to the individuals who know fabric. Um, we also find in the government of Canada um, the ability to say use a t-shirt and cut 20 centimeters from the bottom. So here's a t-shirt that I got from my partner and you know I marked here 20 centimeters and I started asking myself okay well do I cut the hem? Do I add a hem on top? It doesn't say but Coming back here, well, what it does say, and here's the top of the t-shirt over here, and I cut 20 centimeter, and it tells you 
two cut a little rectangle and it gives you the measurements from the bottom of the fabric. And when I do this, oh voila, I have a big seam in the center and this seam will start to unravel. And you can see how wide the mask is. And this was a lady's t-shirt. It was even smaller than the guy's t-shirt. So with the guy's t-shirt, the mask would cover a giant face. So obviously you have to make modification, but they should also tell you that you shouldn't use a t-shirt that has seams. And a lot of ladies' t-shirts have seams, but men tend to have less of them. But obviously, as you start to wear them, it will unravel in the seam. And you have this knit and a knit. Think again like the, the hockey puck and the net. The more you stretch this knit, the bigger the opening that the virus can go through. So any mask is better than no mask, but this is really low on the totem pole in terms of the ability to filter out anything, to put any well, you could fold it in half and maybe put a non-woven uh, paper towel in between, and it may have some comfort, but it's not the greatest thing, um, honestly. Next, um, let's see here what we have. Look at your textiles. And even though I had some fantastic sheets that I cut up, um, they had been laundered a lot and I didn't use the latest sheets. If this fabric is, is tightly woven, um, you might not see any kind of shadow in the back, but it might also be kind of running thin. Um, look for cotton, uh, plain weave, Indian fabric. You can see my shirt through. I wore this shirt specially, not just to dazzle you, but to show you how transparent it is. And it could be wove, uh, loosely woven and be used um, for the masks for individuals who have trouble breathing. So look around your houses, see what you have, um, sheets, towels, um, linen may be more comfortable to certain people next to the face because it has a really great absorbency. So natural fibers tend to be more comfortable. Uh, and if you wanna use a, another um, textile outside that is um, with a blend of some sort, just make sure you have that insert of the non-woven. We have any other question or should I go through the different steps? Because I know it, we're getting to be an hour and this was supposed to be about an hour, but I we think haven't left room for lots of questions. We have an hour and a half, we're fine. We've got okay. 4.30, we're totally fine. Um, so question from the audience. Uh, okay. The latest WHO update spoke about three layers and some of the characteristics uh, of each layer. What do you know of those layers? Have you seen, have you seen the latest update from the WHO, from the World Health Organization? Um, I don't know how recent that was, but they likely are talking about uh, multiple layerings, which lots of people have been doing in the past. And hopefully they have a non-woven because this is just like on the edge of um, research. It's mentioned in some, but not dwelled upon. Um, some people are saying that more tightly woven, the better. But again, if you can't breathe, it's not worth it, especially um, tightly woven with the non-woven. So I don't know if the who came out with something in the past week while I've been working on other things. And if they have, then I haven't read that one. Okay, that's fair. Uh, there's another question of, could you speak to um, the thread count for the, because you did mention that uh, higher quality materials do come with a thread count listed and it's a, sta and it's a standardized list listing. Uh, could you speak to the thread count that one would hopefully aspire to using on the front and back, understanding that, of course, okay. breathability can be an issue, for, could yeah. be a range? So um, thread count, obviously, uh, if we want to go back to like the best thread count, the Egyptian in ancient Egypt had a type of plant that had such a long fiber that the ability of the fiber to put one on top of each other, and even in some places in India, where cotton has been found and woven forever and ever, when it's very humid outside, the ability of the fibers to stick together. So there are fantastic high thread count nowadays that go as high as 600. And in ancient Egypt, it was even higher than that, but that plant um, became extinct. But all this to say that you may have manufacturers that sell you very high thread count um, because of these long staple fiber. Uh, cotton fibers. Um, my sheets are not 600 um, thread count. They were uh, 280 thread count. And I was lucky that my Ralph Lauren sheets had such a distinctive motif that I Googled Ralph Lauren sheet and found the motif 
and found somebody that had it um, with the packaging so that I could document the high thread count. Most people don't keep the packaging of stuff. So um, when you buy new sheets or pillowcases, and I frankly think that pillowcases is uh, much more reasonable if you're not gonna make like 500 um, masks, you can look for something that is um, over 200, is considered high. Obviously, some of the researchers talked about high thread count, like 600 um, thread per inch. And that is not in most people's household. Even I, like, I love good sheets because I'm a textile person, but I don't have a ton of 280 thread um, per, per inch sheets. So look at the manufacturers, look and see what they say. Your color or motif doesn't matter. So some leftover of manufacturers could be a color that nobody likes anymore. I don't know, dark brown is not in fashion nowadays and there may be sales on that. So look for thread counts that is listed on the packaging. A lot of manufacturers will, um, they're not allowed to say it is 600 thread count and mark it unless that's the case because they know it's one of the few instances of household textile where it is reg uh, regulated. So it's, it's a good thing to look online for. But in its packaging, not somebody else tells you it's high thread count. That's fair. Okay. There's also a question as well, which you may or may not uh, touch upon shortly, is how or do you secure the opening between the, the layers to insert the filter? Yes, I did the same kind of finishing, turned it once. Well, actually I'll show it with my um, sample here. So this was the first step. I turned this once, and then the second step is I'll turn it again so that there's no raw edges. So I've done that on both ends. So at the end, you have um, a nice clean edge, only one of which will have this little opening that enables um, the wire to go in. The other, you don't need it. So in some ways, you know that this is the exterior, but it's always best to make it very clear for people. Do you, do you find that the paper filter either falls out or, or is it just through the shape of the jaw that, it, that we don't have to safety pin it if we do have the opening at the bottom? A, there's the friction between the paper that is kind of rough and the cotton. So I've never had that problem. Even when I wear it with the fold up, um, I mean, it'd be hard for the paper to find. And on top of that, it's attached to your, to your head. So... It, the gravity doesn't pull it the way that you would. It's not a very heavy textile either. I forgot part of the question, I think. No, that's, I think, I think you answered it. And otherwise, uh, that person can follow up with me. Um, I'm being uh, overshadowed by a lot of thunder on my end of town, but I think we can, <laughs> hovering over downtown, but we can uh, continue on. Thank you very much, Dr. Bizanet. We're ready to go. No questions at this time. Okay, well then I'll go through the different, um, I've screwed up all of my nice display here, but I will go first through version one and then we'll sh show you the extra step for version two. So as you can tell from version one of this Bissonnet um, modified mask, we have a rectangle of fabric and there it is. And the dimensions on our website, I believe it is, and where's my pattern um, for this? Um, it is 24 by 36. And so I cut and I cut it on the grain because you don't want to have something that's cut sort of what we call on the bias um, because it will not react the same way. Um, I've actually made this one here is, is a reject because I tried the bias to see if it would hug the face better. But part of the problem was that the bias has a lot of elasticity and that seam does not. And it keeps on stretching and it loses the, the, the really tight fit um, as you wear it within like half an hour. Even. Okay, so back to this um, example here. And you have four of these strips of fabrics. And these strips of fabrics are um, two and a half or one inch wide by 42 centimeter. And it doesn't have to be, like if it's more than 42, it's more, slightly less, um, as long as it attaches and you can do a nice bow easily in the back of your head. Um, and so this is essentially version one, the same fabric, both inside and out. And one of the key things is that you have to make sure that you write or 
have some distinctive features so that we know which is closer to the, the face. Next, we will have um, step two that folds, where is my step two? Oh, step two. Yeah, I don't know where it is. Anyway, pretty easy anyway. Uh, you take the back side and you fold it once on top and bottom and twice again top and bottom. So there's no raw edges. So the next step is to mark seven centimeter from the edge only on one end. And then you stitch to seven centimeter. You leave a little bit of, of an opening where your paper clip wire will go in and you stitch all the way through to the other end. So this is for one end, but the bottom you do edge to edge. So this is pretty uh, typical. So that gives you this type of stitching over here. So you can see this is the front, this is the back, top and bottom um, is done. You iron your straps. So first time, second time, third, maybe on top, just one of the extremities. And again, I can't see this properly. Oh, all right. And again in half, and then I can't do this very well in front of a camera. So sorry. And then you stitch on top of it. So you have no raw edges and um, it creates a very, it doesn't have to be the high thread count if you're trying to maximize your fabric. This can be any fabric. You're not gonna breathe through this. This is why I'm saying if you wanna buy this commercial type of bi bias tape, um, you can do that. Um, it's, but if you don't have this, then um, you create your own. Okay, so the first thing I do with this is I fold it in half and create a crease with the iron just so that I know where the middle is. And then I create pleats um, that where the bottom of the pleat goes towards the center, three on top, about, I want to say like an inch or so deep. I'm at the point where it doesn't matter that much. Um, I just do it instinctively. You do the same on top and bottom. And you, I put pins there so that they stick, put it on my sewing machine, and then I stitch the edges. So you can tell over here that I stitch the edges. And my ties, I put them into little bundles because they get really unruly um, at some point. So I put two ties in the center and two ties in one extremity. And then I fold this in half and I will stitch the exterior together. Uh, I'm trying to figure out here. If I stitch this and you want to see me turn it over, then it creates this product. So I will do a top stitch so things will remain in place. And you can see here the bottom opening for the wire. You can see that the um, iron helps me keep things stable, but the moment you put it on top of your face, it expands. So when you sell it or give it to someone, um, tell them about the Parkins const construction. Tell them it's super important because of the way that the non-woven is put together. I just love a paper towel because I can cut it to size. The coffee filter, I don't drink coffee, so I have to borrow from someone to show you. But you can still fit in this coffee filter um, a shape that it's somewhat um, okay for this mask. So if that's what you got, that's what you got. And um, again, don't forget that you can wear it two ways, fold up with no clip or um, the hem with the opening and the wire through, but that the inside is important. Again, I told you this is on our website, the measurements, the paper clip, the dimension of the paper clip. Um, what else did I... Um, I think that's about it. I think that we've covered it. And if I think of any other things, let me go through my notes here, because I had a few notes um, that talked about different aspects of the research. One of which uh, was a bit troubling to me that uh, the CDC in the U.S. knew that there would be a shortage of N95. So obviously, if there was no shortage, I just tell people that I love, and even those that I don't, go buy an N95 mask. That is a respirator, and it's most effective. 
However, when there's a shortage, not only here, but around the world, um, we have to be good citizens too. And people who are putting themselves in harm's way to take care of uh, COVID-19 people in hospitals or at home, um, they deserve to have that level of protection um, for the good of all. So the CDC knew that the shortage would be an issue. Um, the fact that a lot of the textile manufacturings have gone to third world countries have led individuals to not put a very high price on textiles, uh, literally and um, metaphorically. And so the fact that a lot of engineers who are testing fabrics do not know that there it's a world of knowledge um, is in some ways indicative not of their contempt for textile but that this textile knowledge is not something that has been prized in our current society because um, there's very few manufacturers of textiles or people knowledgeable in it nowadays so it's not just uh, a problem of scientists, it's a problem of our culture, our, our non-textile producing culture. Uh, a few more questions came in. Hey. What about pinholes, reducing the eff effectiveness of the fabric's resistance? Yeah, well, that's an issue, um, obviously. I have elected to put the pins here, and if you take a look at where the pins land, they land farther away from the nose. So I try never to pin anything in the central portion over here. Um, some individuals have asked me about using a uh, non-woven interface to actually adhere directly to the mask. I think this might have potential. Nobody's tested this because not only do they not know about textile, but they don't know about sewing supplies. Um, but it's a non-woven and um, it can be washed over and over again. Um, so that's something that I haven't come across in my research, but shows potential. Um, there are other types of masks that don't use um, pins in many ways, but that fold things together. So there's a really interesting, or what they call an origami mask that um, creates a mask that stands away from the face. This is what we call the pressure drop. So for example, if you have an N95 mask, it might stand slightly away from your mouth, which psychologically doesn't make you feel like you're you're you know covered with this fabric that enables you to not breathe you feel like you can you can breathe but you feel very stifled so this origami mask um, folded as opposed to pin and sewed um, has potential it hasn't been tested i hope at some point i'm sure that there's going to be a lot of research being done right now um, to test some of these things um, i hope i don't know but um, obviously that's a concern. To me, it's interesting to have pins to show you in my demo. When I make it at home, I've made over 100 masks thus far. I don't even use pins anymore. I just, I just do it instinctively. So at some point you get to a level of comfort that you use your iron to stitch th things down and you know your machine and how to push things in. But if you're new at this, it's okay to use pins in that it's not gonna be in the front section. We have, and we also have uh, from Sandra uh, mentioning, and I think that we've all probably seen this uh, a fair amount um, as a comment, when we are wearing masks, they also accumulate bacteria and other viruses. I have watched people in grocery stores touch raw chicken and other meat and then touch their masks. I think people need to be reminded that the mask is contaminated with whatever they have been in contact with, not just the coronavirus. So very good comment, Sandra. And it's one of the key 10 pronouncements that always treat your mask as if it is contagious. Mm -hmm. contagious. And um, in some ways, the mask protects you from touching your own face, which we do all the time. So even without wearing a mask, we will touch our faces, which is why people continue to touch their faces, but while wearing masks. So it's a bad habit we have, and the masks makes us aware that we shouldn't touch our faces. But its key function is not to protect us from others, is to protect others from us. So these are very different things between a respirator like an N95 and a homemade mask. However, it's still useful. If you touch your face all the time, 
um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I told my colleagues, one of the things that I found helpful, because I kept on touching my face, is to wear a lot of makeup. By wearing a lot of makeup, when I wear a lot of makeup, I don't touch my face as much. So I ended up wearing a lot of, I don't particularly like wearing makeup, but I wore a lot of it. Um, but I found that the face mask is more effective. <coughs> now, this is, this is a bit of a can of worms, but uh, so one of our um, participants today does not sew. So she's inquiring, where would anyone be willing to sew some masks for her and her husband? Dr. Bissonnette, do you have a little Etsy side business with this or? <laughs> I am certain that there are a lot of people who are out of a job and a lot of seamstresses that would um, contact, go online, find seamstresses, ask for their services. Um, this type of mask you can still produce at home because the strength of this, apart from holding the ties to the end of the mask, the rest of it doesn't have to be the best sewing possible. You can do this at home in front of the TV. You just stitch the edge and you do all of this. If you have um, strips that are pre-made, um, it's even easier. So really it's four thing, four stitches on the corner that have the most importance in, in terms of your ability to stitch over. But look for seamstresses, ask them to do something for you. You could say, I want a mask like the one that's on the University of Alberta website. Could you do this? Or could you do the Government of Canada mask with a pocket insertion? You don't wear glasses, maybe the Government of Canada one is fine for you. Thank you. And I, so far we are out of questions, at least for now. So. Uh, Dr. Bissonnette, oh yes, okay, and someone's saying tons of individuals making masks on Facebook here in Montreal, so uh, perhaps they could list where, what group in Facebook in Montreal, but I think there's also, I'm sure, some lots of people in Alberta as well, and while I'm waiting for that, uh, Dr. Bissonnette, do you have any upcoming projects or uh, social media or other things that you would like to share with us, because I do believe you have some exhibition work right now as well. Indeed. So we have a gallery space called the Human Ecology Gallery, and we usually always have exhibitions happening either by student with the faculty members or by individual researchers um, who do exhibition. That's usually online to alert you to the exhibition and the duration and the visiting hours. However, with the university being closed and nobody coming through, we're not going to have exhibitions, but I had had funding for an exhibition um, called Dress and Historical Escapism. And since I got funding, I need to do this exhibition. I, I had already purchased supplies. So now I'm going to do a virtual exhibition. So at some point um, in late July, there will be an exhibition on, um, it's a th one of three part exhibition, where my portion was to look at how we can learn from dress artifacts um, in terms of research into history. So I do a lot of um, taking measurements out of garments to create patterns. And through these patterns, I understand the production process, but I also understand the change, in my case, from the mid 18th century to the late 18th century and what we have come to, to understand as a modern type of garment that has um, no suppression of the breasts per se. So a type of body that is as we know it today as opposed to the 18th century kind. And what do people in places like Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia who are reproducing um, 1776 tailored garments and what do they know about clothing of that era that is different than just people who study it in textual or visual sources where they don't actually make something. So the value of making and remaking garments is going to be in some ways the part of this um, first exhibition on this three-part series. So that is something that, thank you Saskia for inviting me to mention. Um, take a look at our website and um, get information on this. But also I wanted to let you know that um, Post Canada is a bit overwhelmed these days because when I send masks to Montreal and I've been sending masks pretty, pretty much for April in May, I made every weekend and I would send them. It would take up to two weeks for people to get their masks, which is a really long period of time because they are um, pretty much overwhelmed. So looking for individuals locally, um, supporting your local community, your local artists that may have the ability to create this, 
and post their um, readiness to make things for you is is helping a local population too. But there is a consortium of um, individuals in Montreal that took um, the government of Canada's uh, guidelines to support different businesses that um, contributed to finding answers to COVID and they band together in a co-op and they started making face masks. Now, why they chose fabrics, why they chose their design, it is usually not indicated anywhere. Um, it may be that they follow the government of Canada, it may be that they have that one with the seam in front and they have read about the information um, that scientists contributed all the way to 1912, 1910, but even more recently. Um, most of these masks are not tested. So uh, I'm just erring on the side of caution. So I don't have a stake in making you do any type of face mask, but I do want to help people understand the consequences, for example, of having a non-woven and a woven or something without a seam in front and how if, if we're waging all of the issues, this has to come into play. We have another a very good question as well that has come in, in in between or in the interim. I have been asked to make masks to sell. I feel uncomfortable about profiting from this, particularly cha uh, changing my work from making textile jewelry to masks. What do you think about artists and brands changing to making masks? What do you think about the idea of luxury or fashion masks and how much should we be charging for masks? So I think that was five questions. <laughs> That was an, a fantastic grouping of questions, especially for this group. So obviously, um, when I started making masks for my family, big French Canadian family, my mom was one of 17 kids. So I had cousins um, contacting me, calling me saying, I want to buy a mask. How much do you sell? I'm not going to sell a mask to my family, right? So I spent a whole lot of time making masks and I'm happy I did because I love them to pieces. Um, but at some point, when you do not charge to people who are willing to um, buy a mask from you, there are consequences to other things you can be making. So I think that it's part of that issue of being in an environment that doesn't value textiles, that we think that our skill in making, sewing, producing are not uh, valued, where the care you take in sacrificing ha really high quality um, sheets or buying high quality sheets for people who understand the difference um, from making something that will last and be reused over and over and making it well so that there's no raw edges like the government of Canada um, is something that you should count your time. Your time is worth money and there are not a lot of people who produce masks locally for the exact reason that they cannot make a living doing it. But right now, you're trying to make a living doing it, your time and your expertise. Um, and the, the care you took in taking a workshop and being informed about the topic, a reading on this topic, is also something that people, say financial advisor, they read about their topic. This is factor in into um, the time that they sell to you to create something. So I'm not say, saying that uh, you should be charging crazy amounts, but you should be making um, money in that you're taking your time and your time is worth money. Um, there was another question in there too um, about luxury face masks. And frankly, uh, that is appalling, but luxury anything tries to make money out of selling their logos. So because there is a Louis Vuitton logo on your mask doesn't make this mask more efficient because frankly, an N95 mask um, is more efficient than a Louis Vuitton face mask but you don't want to buy the, the N95 because you want to keep it for the people who need it most. So um, it brings us to this idea of, of the culture of mask. And this is fascinating. And this is an entire study um, for the future, maybe not by me, uh, by anthropologists and sociologists that look at um, face mask and look at it. It's right in front of your face. Instead of, um, jewelry or necklaces. This is the most in your face message you can have. You've seen protesters um, with masks 
written in Sharpie, I can't breathe to talk about uh, the issues that have happened um, in the US and, and things that are extremely strong and bold. So if you're thinking of making a mask that says something, it can say something and still be effective in helping to combat this pandemic. So as an artist, think about a mode of expression words that are non-said when you wear garments. We know that garments is a non-verbal language, but now you can add symbols and words. And how do you go about doing this? Do you add, for example, I have thought of adding a net fabric on top of everything else and um, sewing to this net certain symbols, a red cross, uh, and that will not impact creating holes in the fabric itself because it's a net over it. So this is one of the avenues you can take to express yourself visually and have people wear really interesting masks that they won't find at London Drugs. Um, so if you have something to say, um, try to say it on a piece of tool or net in addition to. So obviously tool is an issue. Uh, if it's very fine, it may destroy self-destroy as you wash it, but um, nylon netting can be very, very strong and still test it with those layers on top and maybe sell a product that's slightly different, more artistic, but still valid in its ability to fight the pandemic. I love that idea of being able to personalize and may have a message. Um, Okay, so we are, we're getting close to time, but we have one more question coming in. Uh, what about wool felt for non-woven layers thinking ahead about winter? Very good question. I thought of that, that's the first thing that I thought of when I was reading about non-woven. Um, I think that it could be like, there usually is much uh, thickness, much, much thicker when it comes to wool felt. So can you put wool felt directly and attach it? Then how do you wash it with hot water? Maybe it's fully felted so it doesn't matter and the results are still um, good. Can you felt, and this is a question, you guys are fiber and, and crafters, so you may want to think about this, but felt has the ability to have a three-dimensionality to it. So can you find a way to felt to um, adhere to the surface of the nose and the cheeks and what have you. And if that's the case, then you may have uh, no need for a woven fabric and just have the felted mask on top of it. And in this felted mask, you can felt different things to create patterns and what have you. And it still creates the circumvoluted um, navigation of the virus through these fibers, which leads to a higher efficiency. So. Test, test and see. Um, obviously you have to be able to wash it and um, obviously it has to be sturdy enough to attach it. But if it makes it hard to breathe, maybe not. But if it's um, as easy to breathe in, then consider it. I've not seen any science on this, but it's a non-woven. I hope somebody starts to test. There's all sorts of grants that have been sent out at the University of Alberta uh, from people in engineering um, to want to test fabrics. And I said, oh, will they test the designs made with this fabric? And the answer was not to my liking. Thank you. So we have, uh, we have a question. OK, uh, Victoria, would you mind unmuting? Sorry, Jen Jenny, she has a question for you. I can't hear you, Jenny. Are you trying to speak? Yeah, I've asked Jenny to unmute. Okay. So you can unmute yourself. Like you can accept that request. Otherwise you can write it in the chat. Yeah, and otherwise just uh, send a chat. And I, I apologize, but I'm a little I think anxious for the thunder. So he's, he's keep he's staying very close to me. Um, so while- Sorry, I hit the wrong button. I didn't Did you hear, hear could you repeat please? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. I didn't mean to put my hand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no 
No okay. worries. <laughs> All right, if you have any other questions, you can find me on the University of Alberta website. My name is French name, so there's a lot of doubles. Um, still, you can look for the Anne Lambert Clothing and Textile Collection. My name will show up. You can send me a message if you have specific questions. If I know the answer, I'll be happy to um, send this information to you. Um, there's a lot on our website. There's a lot of like, why did governments not tell us what they know now? Why did they not tell us earlier? And so I have a lot of information on the different governmental and the reasons why public health is they have people who look at the science, but it's not just about the science. So I'm writing an article on what we've learned thus far so we don't have to repeat things. I'm fairly certain that um, we will have a second wave of this. And so in some ways, even though in Alberta, the reopening is, is advancing, um, we have to be diligent and we have to know that there may be other bouts with this pandemic. So to start now to figure out how, if you need these masks and if other people around you need these masks, how you can supply them and to look and to find the materials and to find things around your house. Um, I think it's, it's relevant now to prepare for tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Pizanet. Uh, we had one more excellent, excellent questions before we do closing remarks, but I can't. Um, and this is, what about leaving a mask out for three days before wearing it again? I've had clients ask about this as clothing stores are, all, are just asked to put clothing aside for three days before letting it back on the floor. Um, so there's information on the, in the popular press about this, but in the scientific articles, they always describe how you have to wash it in hot water, sanitize it, and put it in a dryer. Some uh, scientists have also talked about, for example, say you don't have a dryer and you don't want to wash you don't want to make laundry like every five minutes every time you wear this mask. So it would make sense that you could boil water and put some detergent and boil this water and use the mask to wash it and then putting outside to dry. So the ultraviolet light has some abilities after several days to kill, um, but it's not as um, heavily suggested in the scientific research as putting it in the dryer. Frankly, I wear my mask every day. I go out for a walk, I go um, to, I'm not supposed to go to work, but sometimes I go to work, like right now, because um, my camera is better. And so instead of making a load just for one mask, I will use boiling water. So that has the ability to sanitize it. Thank you. And I would also like to say, um, Thank you for everyone who uh, is attending today. Uh, thank you for those who are able to donate uh, t with the, towards this webinar. This is uh, very meaningful for us. This goes towards future programming uh, for the Alberta Craft Council. And we, would, we very much look forward to seeing everybody again in person. And we will continue to uh, connect virtually. So if you have topics or uh, suggestions or ideas for topics, please do reach out or suggested speakers. Um, we are also incredibly excited to announce that we will be opening up limited hours, our Edmonton location as of this Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So we're so excited. Uh, those wearing masks um, are welcome to come <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy the, the wonders of the Alberta Craft Council. Our members, our professional members have continued to work during this period. So we do have new stock on, not just online. If you can't make it, please shop online. Um, albertacraft.ab.ca. And as well, we have uh, some very exciting um, programming coming up. We have craft collaborations, which was a call that we did to our members uh, to collaborate with people. And that's going towards our fall uh, online fundraiser. So we'll, you'll, see some program, you'll see some things happening with that. And as well, we have uh, our Another Monday meetup will, will be Bright Nights coming out of Calgary. So it's Calgary's turn to be hosting soon. And as well, lastly, we are, at least lastly for me, is we are participating in Canada Helps the Giving Challenge, which is for the entire month of June. Uh, we have, the Alberta Craft Council has the opportunity to win $20,000 uh, for any 
donation to Canada Helps uh, over $3. So can you imagine what we could do for you and our members with that amount of money? So if you have an extra three or five or more, um, just check out our website. There's a donate page there. You can also find us directly on Canada Helps. And I want to thank, of course, Dr. Anne Bissonnette today as well. So generously giving her time uh, to this for us. We are indebted to you and we look very much forward to uh, seeing your, your upcoming exhibition online. Thank you. Good night, everyone.